I'd like to start my talk today with a little quote. Quotes from Howard Marks, a very famous uh, investor from Oak Tree Asset Management in the US. And he says, for investing to be reliably successful, an accurate estimate of intrinsic value is the indispensable, indispensable starting point. Otherwise, what you're doing is effectively hoping for an outcome. Now, what is investing? Investing is putting money down today with the hope of a stream of cash flows or a lump sum at the end of that period of time coming back to you which exceeds what you put into the, into the investment in the first place. Otherwise, it's basically speculation. So when you're investing or comparing investments, with, whether it be stocks, property, bonds, anything else, you're really putting money down to try and get that, that excess return. You're comparing it. And the only way you can do it is by valuing what you expect the outcome to be. A more prosaic example would be buying a second-hand car. If you're buying a second-hand car, you don't walk onto the lot, take the price that the gentleman offers you and say, I'll walk out, great, I'm done. You walk around, you compare the car with other cars that have similar features and functions, you look at the price, you make an assessment of whether you're getting fair value or better value for the money you're parting for that vehicle. And why am I belaboring this point right now? Well, interestingly enough, right now in the small cap space, there, there are increasingly fewer investors actually doing valuations on investing. This graph here just shows you the changes over the last two or three years and the constituents of, of who makes up that small cap marketplace. And you can see there that the value investors, the guys who focus on value you know, solely as a way of investing, have lost money or decreased their impact on the marketplace. And the quantitative investors, or the passive investors, have dramatically increased their impact. On top of this, you've got industry funds bringing money back in-house from many active managers, and they're also benchmarking themselves against the ASX 200 rather than the small company space, which is another 100 companies further down the market cap spectrum. And what that means, I guess, is if you, you know, the passive investors don't care about value, they just buy everything because that's what they do, they buy the index. Um, quant investors buy what's in vogue, what's got momentum behind it, what's going to be more popular in two, three, four, five months' time. Valuations are a pretty small part of what they do as well. And so there are several consequences of this. But I mean, in, if you go back to my car example, that's kind of analogous to walking to the car or walking into a car lot as a passive investor and saying, I'll buy everything at the listed price. Because that's what they do. They buy everything at the listed price. There's no attempt to actually get into it and say, is that fair value? Am I getting a good car or a bad car for that price? Uh, quants are more likely to be looking for the popular car. What's going to be more popular in three, six months' time? Is the red Corvette? Is the Ferrari? And taking a punt on those cars. But if the tide turns or the market seasons and starts to struggle, um, these kind of strategies will, will definitely have a hard time performing. Now, there are a couple of consequences of that money flow into passive and quant. And one of them has been a dramatic re-rating of a part of the marketplace. And what this, what this chart here is showing you is the small companies index broken down into quintiles of PE ratio going back 12 months. So in other words, we, we take it from the smallest PE to the highest PE, and the top 20% of that being quintile five, we just tracked what happened to that PE ratio going forward. And you can see the re-rating there has been extraordinary. Rerated from PE, a Ford PE of 30 times to 118 times PE. Now, part of that's been price performance, part of it's been earnings downgrades, surprisingly. So, a number of those WAC stocks, um, which have very high revenue growth, don't have much profit growth. Or in, fact, in fact, in some cases, they've actually had earnings downgrades. Um, and that's caused that PE rerating to be even more exacerbated than the actual movement in the share price. But you get the sense there just how extreme that movement's been um, driven by that, that weight of money flow. And the second consequence has been a dramatic underperformance of microcaps. Uh, we define microcaps as being any stock in a small ordinary under $500 million in market capitalization. And if you go back over a long period of time, say 10 years, and look at how microcaps and small caps perform, they kind of wobble around a bit, but over time, that, those two basically trend in line and they give you a fairly similar outcome. But over the last 12 months, you can see that gap has opened up dramatically and there's now a 12 to 13% discount between micros and smalls. Uh, which we think is actually an incredible opportunity. And so we've started shifting some of our funds down to that microcap space to take advantage of those incredible dislocations. And it makes sense, right? You've had active guys set, forced to sell some of these, these names down um, in order to fund uh, the money going back into passive and quants. And I'll give you a couple of examples of stocks that we own in microcaps that we think are really interesting. Um, one of them is Mortgage Choice, which many of you will be familiar with. They're a leading mortgage broker in Australia. Um, the graph on the left there just shows you the cash flow dynamics of this company, we fundamental to our process at Sferia, is looking for stocks that have really good cash reconciliation with their earnings. We look at EBIT and look at compare it to free cash flow, and we like that reconciliation to be the same. You can see on the left-hand side there, those two, those two bars are showing you the free cash flow before interest and tax compared to the EBIT, 
And a very good cash flow conversion company has an incredibly good reconciliation of that. And, and over the last nine years, you see the average mortgage choice has been 98%, which is a very high reconciliation. And therefore, in our mind, the earning stream is very high quality. And on the right there, you can see what's happened to mortgage loan volumes. They go through cycles, obviously. And with the clamp down from APRA, um, bank lending standards tightening up, um, and the Hain Royal Commission, obviously, you saw a dramatic decrease in the amount of books were being written. Um, and so combination of those two things, Hain Royal Commission, um, volume was declining, saw the share price dramatically underperform. And obviously with the existential threat of the Hain Royal Commission going on, the shares got really, really, really cheap because people thought the whole thing might cease to exist. Now the shares fell from around $2 to a low of 80 cents about a year ago. Um, at that level we thought, actually about six months ago, we thought that the stock was incredibly cheap. If you, if you, if you value the back book alone, so Mortgage Choice earns money from commissions uh, up front when you write a loan, and then it gets a trail commission from, from the back book for four or five years once the loan's been written. If you assume that Mortgage Choice simply ceased writing any more commissions going forward and just had the back book running off, you get about a dollar a share of value. So at 80 cents, the stock was trading at a really, really discounted valuation. We thought very attractive, so we increased that, that weight dramatically. And just to show you, we're not just about value stocks, we're also about potentially growth stocks. Another good example of a stock we've owned for some time and done very well out of this collective is um, City Sheet Collective, which is a women's retail clothing company. This is interesting because it was actually hidden in a group called Specialty Fashion Group which had um, this brand and five other brands hidden in there. The other brands were struggling, um, lots of stores, not very good sales growth, not much margin. Um, and especially Fashion managed to sell those five brands in exchange for cash and kind of liberate City Chic, if you like, from that, that burden of the rest of the company. Um, so actually on the day of the transaction, we did the work on the company and thought it was really attractive. It was trading at about six times EBIT, had net cash balance sheet, had a very good growth trajectory, and we bought that, those shares. And the stock's rallied really well and actually performed exceptionally well since then. We still think the stock is actually quite cheap. Um, something like 40% of the revenue now comes from online, and that's growing 20 to 30% per annum. And even the 104, 105 stores they currently have are still seeing like-for-like -like sales growth of 4 to 5%, which is really strong in this uh, fairly challenged consumer marketplace. Despite that, the stock has a net cash balance sheet of $35 million, which, which we find appealing. Cash flow has been very strong, and we think it'll grow earnings 15 plus percent per annum for the next five years, and it's trading on a P of about 16 times. So in that market space, we can find interesting stocks, growth, value, um, that have been kind of ignored by the, by the more broader marketplace. Let's give you another example of how incredible the situation we're dealing with right now in small caps is. Uh, Sean mentioned the WAC stocks, and I flagged that before, that sort of high PE band that had re-rated dramatically over the last couple of years. The WAC stocks, if you add their market cap together, you get $30 billion of market cap. Unfortunately, they only earn about $250 million of EBIT earnings before interest and tax, which puts them on an EV EBIT ratio, so a crude PE, PE before, before tax ratio, about 120 times as a basket, which is astronomical. I mean, this is real bubble territory. And we just contrast that with five stocks we own in our small companies fund, you know, KISS FM, which is HT, here, there, and everywhere, HT1, Breville, City Chic, and Asalio. Very solid companies, good, good cash flow conversion, Aggregate market cap is $4 billion by comparison, and yet they actually earn EBIT of $270 million, so a higher EBIT in total than the WAC stocks. Now, the WAC stocks, people will argue, well, they're growing faster. Marcus, you're missing that point. Um, maybe I am, but most of them are growing fast, and some of them have absolutely no earnings at all. So it is quite easy to grow fast if you don't actually have to make a profit, because you can just keep spending money on marketing and ignore the bottom line. Now, the other contrast, obviously, with that is going back to 2001, where we saw the last bubble. Many of these stocks you'll be familiar with, Computer Share, CSL, Cochlear, I mean, these are great companies, and some of the WAC stocks are actually really good businesses as well. We'd, we'd love to buy them if they came back to, to prices we thought were attractive. But this is a reminder, Computer Share got to 250 times PE, um, CSL almost 100 times, Cochlear, Technology One. And obviously, then there were some stocks last time, as this time, that were actually loss-making. So OneTel was kind of a concept disruptive tech and telco that actually struggled and then eventually went bust. And I was reminded the other day of another stock that listed back then called um, Open Telecommunications, OTT. It also floated on day one the stock rallied 400% from its IPO price. So the furore and the interest from, from, from investors in this stuff short term was absolutely intense. And yet two years later, those two stocks were completely gone. They're worthless. And I guess, you know, has it changed this time? Are we in a different environment? We don't think so. So the furore around Afterpay and Zero, et cetera, whilst they may be great companies and maybe disruptors, um, the valuations we're seeing on these things are truly astronomical. So in conclusion, I just remind everyone that we think value does count. Great investors tell us that long-term valuations count. Uh, at Sphero, we, we are an active investor. 
we think valuations will matter again, and we, we spend a lot of time focusing on cash flows, valuations, and balance sheets, and we think that will definitely come back to the full rule. We're uh, ignoring the madden, maddening crowd, the maddening crowds, and focusing on the fundamentals. And um, we think that there's a good opportunity right now opening up a micro caps in the small cap space.